<laughs> is you a faithful uh, assistant is <laughs> on this occasion? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready to, ready to go? Yes, I am, yeah. Welcome back to Meet the Lab Traditions. It's a real pleasure now to introduce Dr. Anne Jules from the University of Manchester and studies in both Paris and then uh, Oxford, and uh, held positions uh, subsequent to that in Texas, <coughs> and then uh, subsequently at the University of Manchester. And uh, she is an applied mathematician who does experiments, and I think we might see one or two of these such experiments. Thank you. Um, so um, I think we need to turn the lights down if you want to see anything. Is this? Yep. Yeah. Okay, you'll see better. So this is, a, this is actually a demonstration. I'm going to show you a version of this demonstration later on in the talk. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, I, I thought, well, I'm going to tell you what I've been doing in the last couple of years, but I'm going to try to get through some um, useful concepts that you might go away with at the end of the talk. And so I'm going to talk about bubbles, because that's what I'm working on. And I'm going to talk to you about um, the sort of phenomena and particularly instabilities and pattern formation that arise in bubbles uh, when you confine them to very small spaces. And um, what I do is, 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 is basically work, in, work experimentally as well as theoretically. And effectively, we, find all the, we always find novel and surprising things when we go and play in the lab, and we love playing in the lab. But effectively, in order to understand these phenomena, we need mathematics. And that's where the mathematical knowledge comes uh, about. I am not actually going to show you any equations in this talk whatsoever, any sort of direct modeling tools. But what I'm going to try to get across is some of the mathematical concepts that underlie these, the, the formation of these sorts of patterns. OK. So, so really, um, what, um, do, what does oil extraction have in common uh, from, uh, with uh, the mechanics of the lungs, or even uh, lab-on-the-chip devices? or manufacturing processes, such as coating uh, processes. And, and the answer is that there's, there's a whole multitude of both industrial and natural processes that involve bubbles. And they involve the motion of bubbles, or in a broader sense, at least some interface between uh, two fluids. There may be a, a gas and a liquid, or two liquids, an interface between two fluids that might be moving. And, and so, for, for instance, here, what do you do if you have a porous rock? And this is a, a, a microscopic view of a, um, a slice of porous rock. And here are the pore spaces where the oil is sitting. And you want to push this oil out. Well, typically, what you do is that you push some other fluid in to try to force the oil out. And, 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 and by doing so, you basically involve the motion of an interface between the two fluids. And that's how you push. Um, uh, this oil out. Now, in the lungs, and this is a sort of cast of, 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 um, of the lungs, uh, uh, you have uh, airways that are elastic, and these are always lined with a thin layer of mucus, and sometimes they can get occluded by mucus. And in that case, you want to force air through them in order to reopen them to allow the lungs to perform their proper duty, which is that of gas exchange and, and, and oxygenate your body. Now, um, here is a, a picture of, of, of um, just representative on, of a lab on the chip application. A lab on the chip application, a uh, uh, lab on the chip is basically that increasingly one is keen to, uh, people are keen to make microscopic um, chemical reactors. So, for instance, to be able to distribute medicine within the body or to be able to m uh, multiply many times processes by having them on tiny microscopic chips. And, and, and so these sort of processes very often uh, involve the motion of droplets, and you need to be able to make these droplets and control them very carefully. What 
if you combine the motion of such bubbles and a strongly confined geometry, and by that I mean you squeeze these bubbles into rather odd shapes, like the shapes of these pores, uh, then you can get a whole sort of, uh, lots of, uh, of, of, of uh, slightly unintuitive behavior in the form of instabilities. And, 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 and we, 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 we never, um, uh, we, we always find new surprising behavior in these sort of systems. And I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to tell you why that is and what's underlying these systems to make them so rich. Okay, so in order to tell you about bubbles, I have to take a step back and start at the beginning. Fluids, in general, uh, are known, uh, 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 typically exhibit instabilities. And the simplest one, probably, that you've all uh, seen, if not noticed, is that of the water out of a tap. So if you take a tap and you turn it on at a small flow rate, you get a very regular stream of liquid. And then you increase uh, uh, the flow rate coming out of the tap, and suddenly your stream becomes disordered. And effectively, what's happened here is, is, is really rather significant, is that as you, as you varied your external control parameter, which is your flow rate, you have seen a transition from a regular, what we call a laminar flow, to a disordered flow. And that is effectively can be characterized mathematically as a turbulent flow. And, uh, um, uh, but but, but for, for our purpose here, all we need to know is that it's disordered. And, and, and this is very intuitive. We know that as the flow rate increases, the, f the, 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 the flow becomes more complicated, it goes turbulent. And the reason, the, f the, the physical reason for this is that as uh, um, the flow becomes faster, it means that you basically increase the role of the destabilizing inertial forces in the system compared with what's stabilizing your flow, and that is viscous friction. So you have a competition of forces at play within your fluid, uh, destabilizing inertial forces that are dominant here, and here you have viscous friction forces that are dominant, and that gives you very, very different behaviors. Okay, so that's for instabilities, and actually, uh, instabilities, I can't, I, I, I can't um, even in a talk on bubble, I can't avoid this, I have to tell you about where instabilities really started, and that was with a, uh, an engineer at the University of Manchester uh, over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and that was Osborne Reynolds, it's his technician in the picture, as it turns out, but... Um, as, as, uh, in, in 1883, Osborne Reynolds made, uh, wrote a paper where he made several very important contributions to the field of, of fluid dynamics, uh, how fluids move, uh, and in particular, he found hydrodynamic similarity. So what does that mean? It means that the flow, for instance, the flow here you have, basically you're looking at the flow down this horizontal pipe in this picture, and you just driving flow comes in at one end, you drive it by putting pressure on it, it goes down the tube, fills the tube entirely, and comes out the other end. And here it's driven under gravity. And, 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 and the flow that of, say, of water that goes through this pipe is only dependent on one single parameter, and that parameter is known as the Reynolds number. And this parameter combines the speed of the flow, the size of the pipe, and the properties of the liquid, such as viscosity. And that's a very important finding because it implies that you can change your fluid, and as long as you get the combination of the flow parameters right, uh, so that your Reynolds number remains constant, you should see exact, exactly the same flow in golden syrup. So water and golden syrup are actually don't behave in a dissimilar manner, even though you know that golden syrup is a lot more viscous than water. And that's because the flow only depends on the combination of viscosity, speed, and, and size of pipe. Now, what this Reynolds number does is that it measures the importance of the inertial forces in your fluid relative to the viscous friction, what dissipates the energy. And, 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 and so this Reynolds number is going to basically tells you, tell you typically when the fluid goes unstable. So the original experiment of Osborne Reynolds was... Um, is, is still in Manchester. It's a quite an impressive setup. It survived 150 years, and it's to see in the School of Engineering. Um, 
the, so the second, so after this hydrodynamic similarity, you know you only need one parameter to describe uh, the flow in your pipe, for instance, then what Reynolds observed is that the flow in the pipe, as you increase this Reynolds number, goes from laminar to turbulent. And the turbulence here arises in a, in a rather um, unusual manner in that um, it depends on um, how much uh, outside perturbation there is, so how much noise there is in a room. For instance, if there's a lot of vibration in the room, the turbulence will arise earlier at a lower Reynolds number. But that's beside, uh, I guess, it, beside the point here. What I want to show you is just a picture from an experiment in Manchester where you see such turbulent flow propagating. And you see, basically, generally, it's completely laminar, and then suddenly you have a puff of turbulence that passes. It's laminar again, and then you have a puff of turbulence that passes. And that is a, now we have increased the Reynolds number, so our inertial forces are large enough to give you disorder. In that puff of turbulence that you see, the flow is completely disordered and probably relatively unpredictable. Okay, so, so that gives you... Um, an idea that, that, that um, y you will find um, instabilities and transition to turbulence in fluids as soon as you make them flow. And, and that, 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 that um, um, extends to weather predictions where you have a turbulent atmosphere and that you will, uh, you will study in very much a similar manner to the way we study these flows mathematically. Now, so what drives, I mean, inertial forces, that's all very well, but what, what really drives this instability? And here's the, the big concept. And the big concept is nonlinearity. And that's a mathematical concept. And um, um, a couple of days ago, I asked some of my colleagues in the department, you know, how would you describe nonlinearity to the layman? And they said, well, nonlinearity, that means that it's not linear. And... Um, and so, um, so I say, yes, um, so it's not linear. OK, linear, what's linear? Linear, if you have a linear behavior, it's very predictable because, say, you take a spring, and if you want to ex you, ex you apply a certain force, and you extend the string by a certain distance. Now, apply twice the force, and you extend the string by twice the distance. OK, so that's a linear behavior. It's just proportional. You apply a force, you double the force, and you ex the extension of the, str the spring is, is twice, the, twice, twice, the, uh, twice the extension due to applying twice the force. OK, that's linearity. But that's not very, very helpful in this context, I think. Um, OK, so, so what's nonlinearity? So to me, nonlinearity is um, what makes the world beautiful. If you didn't have nonlinearity in the world, you wouldn't have any patterns, you wouldn't have any complexity, you wouldn't have anything behaving in any complicated manner. You, so, 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 so just to take you right back to basics, nonlinearity will arise as soon as you try to uh, model the interaction between, say, two particles or two people or more, or, or, or even further, larger groups of particles, people. Nonlinearity is going, what's going to make, to some extent, your, crash, uh, your stock exchange crash. Nonlinearity is also what is going to make your fluid turbulent. Okay, so nonlinearity is a mathematical concept, and you know I could give you an equation and show you what nonlinearity is an in an equation. It wouldn't actually help you because you need a very broad background to really understand the full uh, implications of it. But effectively, what I think I can do is to show you some consequences of nonlinearity in some fluid systems, and I've chosen these confined bubbles to show you some of these consequences. The point about nonlinearity, really mathematically, is that it makes the equations very hard to solve analytically. And because it makes the equations that, say, governs your fluid very hard to solve analytically, that's why I'm here, why I do experiments. Because mathematicians can't do this. Okay? They can't actually solve the equations of turbulence. They've been trying for 150 years and they can't do it. And actually, more fundamentally, there are no exact solutions to the equations that govern fluids. So, um, so that's why in these sort of fields and in any field of science that has some bearing on reality, on reality and practical applications, you will need a combination of experimental scientists 
and the theoreticians to really make progress in understanding. So, 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 so nonlinearity arises as soon as you want to, um, to describe mathematically the interaction between particles. Well, in your fluids, you can think of a fluid as a collection of a, an infinite number of particles. And, and in your fluids, it's, it's the inertial interaction that is nonlinear. And that's why increasing the Reynolds number gives you turbulence, or gives rise to instability. OK. But of course, it's not specific to fluids. And it arises in all sorts of what we call dynamical systems, systems that change their behavior in time. What I want to uh, really show you is some conse nice consequences of nonlinearity, and in particular, a, a very clear consequence of, of, of the nonlinearity of governing equations is that if you put a constant input, say a constant flow rate, into your pipe, you can get multiple multiple sort of um, flows out of it, or you might get some time, some uh, flow that depends on time, or you might get even disorder, turbulence, or more simply chaos. And um, these three consequences of nonlinearities are probably the most striking uh, that you may come across. So, okay. This is the, so if, if you've given up at this point, let's look at, let's, let's get you, um, you know, wake up again. I'm going to show you a demonstration. Um, okay. So the demonstration is, basically, can we demonstrate chaos simply in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the lecture theater? And, 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 and for, to demonstrate chaos, we don't need a fluid. We don't need an infinite number of degrees of freedom. What all we need is actually three degrees of freedom. OK. OK. OK, so, so what I've got here to demonstrate chaos is, is this piece of, of, of this toy here. And, uh, and, um, and so it's a, it's, a sort of, it's a simple pendulum. So you've probably seen a simple pendulum before. And, and the question really is, uh, do you have any idea um, how many quantities will fully describe the behavior of this pendulum? You know, to know, so you need to know where the pendulum is at an instant in time, so what, what its position is, so what is its angle. That's one quantity you need to describe what it's doing. And then you need to describe its speed. Okay, once you have its speed and its position, then you know everything about what that pendulum is doing. So that gives you two degrees of freedom. Okay, not enough to give you chaos. So, so you take this pendulum, and, um, and, and what can you do? Okay, it can go round in circles. It can oscillate. It can sit, hang down, and in principle, it could stand up. That's like the hill that Linda talked about this morning. But of course, any perturbation will kick it off. So it's unstable. OK, so, so do you have any idea how you would? This is, this is described by just two variables, two degrees of freedom. Do you have any idea how you would make this pendulum into a system that has um, more than two degrees of freedom, at least three? What would you? Yes, up there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You take off the knot in the middle, and you make it into a double pendulum. So now you have two pendulums that are coupled together and do not behave independently of each other. Okay? And there's nonlinearity. So, 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 so there's, um, there's fundamentally, so we now have a double pendulum. And there's fundamentally nonlinearity in the equations that govern how this thing moves. But of course, this thing um, has very simple equations. All we need is Newton's second law of mo motion. And, and it's a very simple system to describe. So you can write down the equations really easily. There's no point in doing so. But I can tell you that you, in order to describe its motion, you need two angles, two angular velocities, and you know everything about it. So it has four degrees of freedom. Enough for chaos. So if you take, if you take and give it a small initial condition, it will just oscillate. And that behaves in a very regular manner, nothing unpredictable about that, nothing disordered about that. It will just oscillate back and forth. But the reason for that is you've only given it a very small initial condition. If you give it a big initial condition and you take, make use of the full nonlinearity of the equations, <laughs> you 
is what you get. And, and at that point, he seems to behave in a completely random manner. <laughs> and I couldn't tell you what he's going to do next. It's gone chaotic. Uh, after a while, he loses because there's friction here, so he does lose a, a, a great deal of its energy. But, but I can let it go again. And uh, you know, the more energy I put to start with, the more he does here, yeah, and he hits the table. But anyway, you, you get the idea. And so it really looks like it's got a life of its own. And this is a direct consequence of non-linearity. The fact that this system is non-linear. If it was simply linear, it would only oscillate back and forth. It wouldn't do this. And what's interesting here is that, um, OK, I'm telling you this is chaos. But you, know, you might say, well, what's the difference between chaos and random? It just seems to behave in an unpredictable manner, a random manner. So what's different between chaos and random? Well, you know, the, the equation, this is sec Newton's second law of motion that, that governs this. There's nothing random about that. It's completely deterministic. If you know where you start, you know where you end. So, 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 so what makes the dynamics unpredictable? And really, the dynamics are unpredictable, and it's quite a subtle argument, is because this system is extremely sensitive to where it started. So wherever I started here, or slightly displaced, is going to behave completely differently. And you can show that by integrating the equations. And here, for instance, on this graph here, what I'm showing you is the time trace of the angle of the pendulum. Okay? And if you start with two initial conditions that are almost similar, they only differ by a part in a million, they're almost the same initial conditions. Initially, the two traces are superposed, and the, the pendulum behaves in its random-looking manner, very chaotic manner, but all the two traces are superposed. And then suddenly, at a given time, they start to diverge from each other. And when these traces diverge, that's the effect of the sensitivity to initial condition and the fact that in practice, at this time, you've started your pendulum at almost the same point and it's sitting at completely different angles at, after finite time. And that's really a very important fundamental concept to understand. And it's probably the most striking uh, um, um, consequence of a nonlinear system. The fact that out of a very simple system like a pendulum like that, you can get completely unpredictable behavior. OK, so I can show you. I've got a little, um, map, a little uh, simulation of this. So you can simulate uh, a time series, just exactly the same slide that I showed you here. I'm going to start with two initial conditions that are of millions, uh, so one in a million apart. And you should basically see. It's integrating in real time, so you can see that the computer is not struggling with this. This is easy. These are easy equations to find a, an approximate solution to. And you can see that after a finite time, you have my two traces, blue and red, completely separate. And, that, and, and so if you look at one particular time, say at 9,000, you can see that the angle is completely different in the blue case and the red case. So you got effectively, practically, unpredictable behavior. And there's lots of lessons to be learned from these simple systems to inform you about more complicated systems, such as turbulence and you know, what happens in the atmosphere, how you predict the weather, for instance. OK. OK, so, 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 so far, I've just shown you, uh, first of all, uh, sort of traditional fluid systems where you had, you just increase the speed of the flow and you get the transition to turbulence. You get more and more complicated behavior the faster you go. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm actually looking at bubbles and my bubbles don't go very fast at all. And what I'm, um, so, 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 so let's see how can I, in looking at bubbles that are, are hardly moving at all, certainly not very fast, so inertial forces are not strong at all in the systems I'm going to look at, how come that I can then get instabilities? And so, again, intuitively, you will all know that if you 
spread a layer of liquid on your ceiling, what will it do? It will drip, yeah. It will drip. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Right, let's hope that it works. Do you see it? So I've got a layer of liquid, and you can see these droplets forming. At the moment, it's just dripping, because there's quite a lot of liquid there. Oops, that's gone out of the field of view. So you can see that basically, and little by little, you'll see in a minute, it's going to form a whole pattern of little droplets. And once enough has dripped down, there won't be enough liquid to form another droplet that can pinch off, and you'll just end up with a nice pattern of droplets that are just hanging there. So why is it dripping? Have you ever thought why liquid that you put on the ceiling is drips? So for instance, does, does liquid drip because air, the air that's sitting underneath, cannot support the weight of the liquid? Is that the reason? Is gravity? So gravity is definitely involved, uh, yes. But it's not as simple as just saying, is it gravity? Is it, so, I mean, in principle, what's the pressure of air? Can air support a thin layer of liquid? No. Yeah, it can. It can support 10 meters of water. The air pressure is enough to support 10 meters of water, big, thick column of water. There's enough pressure in our ambient air to support 10 meters of water. You can make the calculation. It's very so, so that's a very simple sort of back of the envelope calculation to make. And, and so, 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 let me see. Let me give you another sheet. We're getting a pattern now. So, so it's not simply that... Um, Ah, it's visualized, it's not. Okay, so, it, so you have these droplets hanging and it's starting to form a pattern. But it's not simply that um, it's dripping because, you know, air can't support this liquid. What's really happening is that the interface goes unstable. And that's really essential. Here, the interface can deform. So we don't have any inertial forces, we don't have any sort of fluid moving fast. Okay? But the interface can deform. So you can take a nonlinear shape, not a straight line. Okay? And so we have Reynolds number zero, no inertial forces. And here, all the nonlinearity that's going to create our instability comes from the free surface. The fact that the surface of the liquid can deform. And you can get lots of interesting patterns forming as a result. So what happens here? So I think you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, gravity is a driver here. Because, of course... As a, so, so the idea, is, the mechanism is to say, okay, you have a flat interface to start with, and then you say, okay, imagine there's a small bit of noise, a small initial perturbation to the interface, so it slightly deforms. What will happen then? Well, the oil will want to migrate into the trough to lower the potential energy. Okay? And so you will enhance the initial perturbation by pushing more fluid into the trough and deforming the interface further. So the initial perturbation is amplified, but it's not because it's heavy that it's falling. It's because the interface goes unstable, and that's really quite a subtle difference. Okay. Okay. So, so for the rest, so, so, so far I've given you lots of, um, of, general, well, of general background, which I think are, is important, and now I just want to give you some specific images from stuff we've done in the lab. And I, I have another demo that is, is rather nice to finish with. Okay, so, 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 so what about these confined bubbles? So we found that as we, as we, um, com uh, as we, uh, as we force our bubbles through increasingly intri intricate and confined geometries, we get a lot of instability because basically we deform the interface in a very complex manner, and they tend to go unstable. So one of the examples I want to show you is that you can get multiple bubbles. And that's in the problem of airway reopening, pulmonary, where you want to re reopen the airways of, say, a newborn baby. 
the second point I want to make is now if you make a complex poor geometry, like in a, in a rock, you can then get some really unexpected behavior. And from a completely constant flux input, you input a constant flow rate, you get that completely oscillatory behavior. Now, and I'll show you uh, the pattern formation that results from that. And then eventually, I will show you an experiment on fingering, which is um, uh, where I have a last demo. Okay. So, oh, I don't know what's happened now. We got it in double. Okay. Anyway, we'll keep it in double. Um, um, okay. So. So, so, so when a baby is born, a baby that's in, uh, is, uh, in, in the uterus is, is, um, has its lungs filled with water, or mucus. And, and, um, and, and, and so during the birth process, um, the lungs are effectively emptied of water through compression. And, and effectively, as a result, uh, the lungs are collapsed. And, and, and one ex I mean, we don't know for sure, but we expect that lung collapse is presumed to be really, really extensive. So if you take, um, 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 so, so, and the reason you can collapse the lungs is that the lungs are effectively formed of a branched um, network of elastic tubes. So you can think of all your airways branching out down from the main airways as elastic tubes, okay? And, and these are filled with this liquid, and then you put pressure on them through the birth process, for instance, and, and the lungs collapse. And when an elastic tube collapses, say it started off with a circular cross-section, what you expect then is if you put pressure on it, it will buckle into an elliptic shape, and then it will buckle further and end up in this H shape. And that's the H shape on that picture here. And also, if you look at the, the projection of the cross-section, it will eventually look like that. And what's interesting about that cross-section is that in the middle of the cross-section, you've just collapsed your elastic tube that was initially circular, and you collapse it, and the middle part of the walls touch. Okay? So you have opposite wall contact, or near opposite wall contact in the middle, and some side lobes where there's still fluid on the sides. And the question then, if, if you have a baby it's just been born, the baby takes its first breath, takes a big um, uh, uh, breath of air, what happens? How does the baby manage to breathe? How does it manage to, do, to, to initiate the gas exchange that takes place right at the bottom of the lungs in the alveoles? For that, you need this air to be able to propagate all the way down the branch tree of elastic tubes that are all clogged up with liquid. Reopen these tubes and eventually initiate the gas exchange. So how does that happen? And people have been very interested in the mechanics of this for a number of years, and, and in particular because in hospital, if a, pro if a newborn baby has problems breathing, you just inject it with a huge syringe of surfactant. That's the solution. It's a completely empirical solution. And, and, and doctors have so said, well, actually, we'd like to fine-tune this process because this is rather rough on the baby. It works, but, 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 but it's far from optimum. And so effectively what you have, the mechanics of it, is that you have this collapsed tube with liquid in, you inject air into the tube, and the, you find that a long bubble of air propagates and then reopens the initial, initially collapsed airways. And, um, and we've, did, we've done experiments. We've done exactly these experiments in the lab, the purely mechanical experiments. And what we find is that depending on how strongly we initially collapse the airway. So if we collapse it so we have opposite wall contact or even extensive opposite wall contact where the side lobes are very, very small and there's very little liquid left in the tube, we get different types of propagating bubbles. And the bubbles that you're seeing here is basically air that's pushing the, um, in this case in our experiment, oil, the air is coming in from the right and pushing the oil, and you're looking down at this tube that we're investigating uh, experimentally. But what's interesting is you can see the outlines of these bubbles, and when the tube's not very initially very collapsed, you just get a nice, symmetric, simple bubble, as you would expect. But then you get these asymmetric bubbles and these double-tipped bubbles, and most interestingly, these pointed bubbles. 
The asymmetric and the double-tipped bubbles are sort of intuitive because if you think of this geometry of your, of your collapsed cross-section that this bubble is trying to re-enter, well, there's going to be less resistance in the wider sections. And so it's quite natural that the bubble is going to try to go down one side or the other, or even both sides, and avoid the middle, which is very strongly collapsed, because that's where the resistance is highest. And so intuitively, you would say our oh, asymmetric double tip, those are, are reasonable in, intuitive sort of behaviors. What about this pointed bubble, where the bubble is then reopening the most collapsed part of the tube? And this is something that we, we have absolutely no idea why that happens. OK, so um, you, can, you, can, you, can, um, you can think of the same geometry where you take a tube filled of liquid and you blow air into it and you look at the propagation of a bubble. But now we make our tube, we make it a bit simpler by making our tube rigid. And then we, we, we mimic the fact that the tube is collapsed by constricting the center of the tube here where we make a, a cross-section where there's a hump in the middle. So it's, it's a narrow in the middle and wide on the sides. And then you, we blow air down it. So if there was no constriction whatsoever, you would see a bubble going down it. That would be something like this. And it would just be a nice symmetric bubble, a bit like the one I showed you before. Here's air entering oil. But now, so imagine, we have basically the long problem, if you like, but without the fact that, without tubes that are elastic in a rigid uh, cell. And, 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 and again, if you increase the flow rate at which you push the air in, and that's on the x-axis here is effectively the flow rate at which you push the air in, then you can get all sorts of different bubbles propagating. Some are symmetric, some are asymmetric. And you get effectively these multiple modes of propagation that are direct consequence, again, of the nonlinearity of the system. But the most surprising is this. is the fact that you're driving this bubble with a constant flux, and as a result, you get an oscillatory bubble coming out. And here, what it's doing, the bubble is coming towards you, and you're kind of looking from the top at it. And what it's doing is tip is, 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 is at the bottom of the screen. And, and at a fixed distance behind its tip, there's an oscillation, a sideway oscillation, that forms this pattern that is then shed behind the tip of the bubble. So you, get, you have some form of, basically, you're able to convert a constant input into some form of oscillatory input. And you can see a movie of that in a simpler by looking at the top, and you can see that that really happens in, in real time, that literally you're forming this pattern as the bubble is moving forward. And so we've now seen two examples. We've seen an example of where you have of, of the effect of nonlinearity, where you get an instability, where you can get different modes of bubble propagation, and now you have one where you put in a constant flux and you get out an oscillatory state. And this really surprised us to start with, and we spent a lot of time thinking about why this was. And the explanation is actually rather subtle and beyond the scope of what we can talk about here. But effectively, it's always the same idea. You look at the forces at play in the system, and here there are, there's no inertial forces, but there's viscous and surface tension forces. And somehow they un interact with the very constricted shape of the tube in a, 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 a rather subtle manner to form these oscillations. And now prospects of using these type of oscillating bubbles in microfluidic devices, lab-on-the-chip devices, for additional passive control of droplet motion. OK. Finally, I'm going to, I don't know what time it is. Um, I'm going to give you my final demo. And this is quite a nice one if I don't show you anything else. This is a rather nice one to have a look if I can make it work. So, so the idea here is that we're going to look at this cell, this, um, this cell, and what I'm going to, what this is, is uh, two plates, flat plates, transparent, and they're separated by 
thin separators. So you have basically a, a, a thin space between these plates into which I'm going to inject a liquid. And hopefully I'll be able to do that with, on that visualizer, although I don't think I've adjusted it completely as it should be. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Right. So that's a middle. That bit here is the middle of my cell. And well, now I need to find this syringe. And so the liquid I'm going to inject is rather viscous. It's effectively sugar syrup with ink in. Uh, and I've mixed it sort of with some water to try to adjust the viscosity, and I'll see if I can get it in. So the point here is that, can you see this uh, liquid is going in? And, when the, and the liquid is going in, and, and, and as it goes in, it just goes in completely smoothly, and the interface is completely stable. So uh, it makes an ellipse on the visualizer, but on, in, in real life, it actually makes a, a circle. I, uh, mo I mourn the disappearance of overhead projectors, which were a lot easier to, to make these demos with. OK, so, so now I've injected. And what you've seen is that as I injected this liquid into this cell, what you saw is that you saw that the interface was completely stable. There was nothing odd going on at all. Um, and now you can effectively sort of assume that you've got a cell that is filled with this sugar syrup, blue. And what I'm going to do is now do the opposite experiment. So now I'm not injecting the li liquid into the air. I'm going to inject air into the liquid. So I'm going to do exactly the opposite in experiment. So I, initially, the cell was filled with air. I injected liquid into it. Now I'm going to inject air into this liquid. OK, moment of truth. OK, so it's going to be very quick, so don't miss it. And I can't do it again. Um, or maybe I can do it again. I don't know. Let me try. That's it. So, so it formed this beautiful <coughs> dendritic pattern. And that's a very famous instability um, that is known as um, uh, viscous fingering. And it happens in oil wells, and it happens in lots of uh, smaller scale uh, processes as well. So I'm going to do it again. It's not quite as clean now, but basically all I need to do is, is, is press air into there and you get this, this dendritic pattern forming, a bit like a fern developing. So, 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 so what's happening here? Well, what's happening is that, that as long as I injected the more viscous liquid into the less viscous liquid or less viscous fluid, the interface was stable. Now I've injected the less viscous, so the air into the more viscous, the interface is unstable. Okay? So your parameter, if you like, is the viscosity difference, in a sense. Okay, so, so, so what I want to show you is that, so that's a very well-known phenomenon. It's a very impressive phenomenon. It has, and the patterns that grow from there, that you can see on the picture on the left, uh, have a lot of, so, so, in a, are, are probably the simplest expression of a broad family of propagating fronts, which can be um, uh, that relate closely to snowflakes and um, uh, crystal formation, and uh, the growth of ferns and the growth of trees, and the increasing interest in unifying all these forms of growth uh, into a, a, a sort of a, um, a, 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 a smaller sort of um, 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 set of dynamics, basically understanding the dynamics. Uh, or, so, so basically, you can, you can, you can basically the dendritic growth that you get out of there has bearing on fractals. It, basically, this thing is fractal, and you can do a lot of both mathematics and physics using these sort of test systems. 
But, 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 but I want to show you something we've been doing, which has been quite amusing, and we've, we've had a lot of fun with in the last year, because we've done the rigid cell experiment, and, and, and really there's, there's, there's a lot done about that, so there's nothing very novel there. And you can basically, if you look carefully, you'll see, can you see the, the pattern just about propagating? It's very faint. Okay, but now what we've done is instead of having two rigid plates making up our cells, we've sort of so played with the confinement of the cell by making the top plate elastic so that it can deform. And when we do that, can you just about see what's happening? Instability disappears. So all we need to do to get rid of that very intricate pattern is to now um, basically make the cell properly elastic with a thin membrane on the top instead of a rigid plate, and the compliance allows you to get rid of all the instability. So that's not quite true, because um, uh, in the previous two movies I was driving at the same parameters, same same fluid, same flow rate, but now if we increase the flow rate here on the right, uh, you should see a new instability appearing. And you get a new pattern forming. And now it's a pattern that forms when your top plate is elastic rather than rigid. And so you can see that just changing small things like that make an infinite complexity. An inf it's, it's a, these are systems are extremely rich. You change a little thing, you get completely different behavior. How do you explain that? And, 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 and it is really, and, and the reason I say, how do you explain that? We don't, we spend basically our lives trying to do experiments and model these things in order to gain an understanding of why small changes made huge changes to the dynamics. Okay, so I think I'm going to, is that, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here and tell you just in conclusion, that uh, if you remember anything from this talk, please remember that instabilities arise because of a mathematical, a very important mathematical property, which is uh, that the dynamics of the systems that can go unstable are non-linear. That's completely, ob completely you, can't you can hardly avoid it in fluids. For fast flows, you have inertial forces that are nonlinear, but, but, but you can replace your inertial force by a, a free surface if you don't have inertial forces, and you get lots of interesting instabilities. And, and really, uh, what we have found is that we've played around with these systems, and we always found new things that surprise us, and that we are then eager to try to model and understand in both a physical and a mathematical way. And of course, the, the, the great strength of mathematical modeling is that not only does it allow you to understand what's going on, but in principle, it should allow you to predict what is going on when you make a change to your system. Thank you for your attention. Sorry. It's very long. I apologize. Um, time for one quick question for Anne, if anyone has a question. Sorry, I've, I've completely run over time. So. Well, thank you very much, Anne. Okay. A really outstanding. Talk.